Okay, good morning everybody, welcome back. So, I want to make two announcements before we start. The first is that Tanya, who's teaching the tutorial, she said I should tell you that you should fill out the evaluation for the tutorial. So if you have uh, received that request, that survey, please do it. I want to use that uh, announcement also to remind you that you should also fill out the survey for this course. So there's two separate ones. The one you got, um, I think, last week or two weeks ago is for this course in general, which is the lecture and the course in general. And then there's one which is just, just about the tutorial, which is taught by Tanya. Okay? So please do that. Uh, remember to do that if you haven't done it yet. Good. So today we're going to talk about exchange rate politics and we do, to some extent we are putting the theories or the, the arguments that we made last week about the collapse of the Bretton Woods system and the collapse of the gold standard on a more general ground and apply them to the exchange or the monetary system, international monetary system today. So I'm going to quickly review uh, exchange rate regimes and how they can look like. And here we need to talk about measurement because it's not obvious how we should measure exchange rate regimes. So that's what we're going to do in the first part. And then I'm going to give you two types of arguments what, why countries choose one exchange rate uh, regime or the other and what the political implications of these exchange rate regimes are. Um, so we touched upon many of these themes that we discussed today uh, already last week, especially the sectoral interest approach. We already talked about this, but we're going to widen this a bit and then apply it to Switzerland. I call it the Swiss peg, right? The Swiss franc was fixed. The exchange rate of the fi Swiss franc was fixed for a while. Then it was this fixed exchange rate was given up. And that nicely illustrates how political exchange rates can be. Often they are not, but sometimes they are. And Switzerland is a great case, I think. And that's all the political approach, uh, but there's uh, an equivalent uh, approach that more comes more from uh, economics, which is the credibility approach. And here there's a big debate whether the Phillips curve and much of the arguments are relying on the idea that there is a Phillips curve, an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, whether this relationship still exists. And this is actually very much debated exactly these days. I'm going to refer you to a few newspaper articles on this. What's interesting is that the political approach and the credibility approach to some extent uh, lead to competing predictions. They, ha they provide predictions about what a government should do uh, that, are con that, are, that are contradictory. So at the end we're going to discuss how to what extent we can reconcile them and we can make sense of all this. So as a start, I want to I wanna begin where it ended last week. So remember that the Bretton Woods system collapsed and countries were more and more moving towards flexible exchange rates. And these flexible exchange rates, to some extent, were illegal. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, governments who had them would get into trouble. But nonetheless, it was inconsistent with the rules that we and the norms that we saw uh, in that in the international monetary system at that time. So flexible exchange rates were legalized in this meeting, uh, in the Jamaica, Jamaica meeting in 1978, which led to the second amendment of the IMF. And uh, this meant that now uh, we uh, only were obliged to have a, s a stable system of exchange rate instead of a system of stable exchange rates, right? That was this twist that came out of these negotiations between the big, uh, the big powers in the Western world where France wanted to have a fixed exchange rate regime, but the US did not want to have it anymore and therefore we have this, this new formulation. Uh, we're going to talk more about this, this split between France and the United States when we talk next week about the European monetary system and how the Eurozone emerged. So what the European countries did is they tried to 
develop an own little Bretton Woods system within Europe. So the European currency systems after the breakdown of the Bretton Woods were modeled after the Bretton Woods system. So to some extent, the European countries try to do what, try to implement what just, uh, what just uh, disappeared on the global level. And they try to implement this on the regional level in Europe. So we're going to talk more about this next week. Now what we have is great variation exchange rate regimes. Uh, we have growing capital, uh, capital openness, so there's more and more international capital flows, which has a great impact on the politics of exchange rate regimes, as we're going to see in a moment. And we, l we now have this non-system where each country can do what it wants. So let me just quickly classify the different types of regimes that we can have. So the first one is a free floating regime, as it's called, or a flexible exchange rate regime. And in this flexible exchange rate regime, uh, the current, the value of a currency is determined by supply and demand in the market. So if everybody wants to buy Swiss francs, and that's what happened in the last 10 years, then the exchange rate, the value of the exchange rate obviously goes up. <coughs> if nobody wants your exchange rate, the value of this, uh, of this currency goes down. Um, then we have managed floating regimes uh, where, it's where we have supply and demand playing an important role, but nonetheless countries interfere, interfere very heavily in the foreign exchange markets. So the, 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 the central bank buys or is selling own currency to influence the exchange rate. So. And then we have a currency pack. So in the currency pack, the government or the, f the, the central bank decides to fix the price of your currency vis-a-vis -vis another, vis -vis another currency. So uh, you specify a price and you keep that fixed. And that's exactly what we had in a Bretton Woods system, right? We had a system where uh, the the German mark was fixed to the US dollar, at a, uh, so they were exchanged at a fixed price. They could be adjusted, this price could be adjusted eventually from time to time, but that was the principal idea. Where would you classify Switzerland now? What do you think? So as I said, Switzerland fixed the exchange, right? So for a while, Switzerland had a currency pack, then it gave up the fixed exchange rate. What do you think? Where are we? Yes. Managed float, in which way is it managed? So it's clearly not a fixed exchange rate anymore, right? But how do we know that it's managed? So we cannot really know, but uh, so it's we can see it in the balance sheet of the, of, the, of the Swiss National Bank to some extent, but we actually don't really know. We cannot observe what they do, right? That's a bit of a problem when we look at measurements, so I'm going to talk about this in a moment. But we're clearly in a managed floating system, although, although in the last few months there was less and less intervention by the Swiss National Bank, right? So we are actually somewhere in between now. Yeah. But they're carefully watching the, the, the currency or the exchange rate, and there's if, it's gonna, if the value is going to increase again, they're clearly going to switch back to the managed floating. So how can we measure exchange rate regimes? So uh, there's the IMF annual report and exchange rate arrangements in which the IMF publishes what countries tell the IMF what they do. So th that's why I call the jure exchange rate. That's what they claim, what they legally, that's what, what they say uh, it is. Um, and and there's big data sets that actually look, keep, uh, <coughs> just measure the exchange rate regime of different countries over time based on what countries say. Now there's a problem. Governments <coughs> lie. Governments lie when they report the exchange, what they, the exchange rate regime to the IMF. So this data on, the, uh, on announced uh, exchange rate regime was used a lot uh, in economics to study the effect of the exchange rate regime on business cycles and all kinds of economic variables. 
And what we found is really strange results which had nothing to do with what the theory said. Now that could be the theory being wrong, fine, <laughs> but there was a suspicion that de facto countries do something different than what they say. So Reinhard and Drogo wrote this famous paper to economists that looked at de facto exchange rate behavior. So we cannot see how much a government, uh, a central bank interferes, right? We don't see that. But what we can see is how much the exchange rate really varies and whether this actually matches what they say. Now that uh, requires some arbitrary definitions of what a flexible and a fixed exchange rate is. But nonetheless, we can look at actual uh, exchange rate behavior and they categorize exchange rates into four categories, fixed, limited flexibility, managed floating, and freely floating. And they apply the follow sta following standards. So if you have no separate currency, if you don't have an own currency, obviously that's a fixed exchange rate regime. So that means no separate tender, right? That happens from sometimes, but not, uh, not that much. But then we can have an official or de facto peg, uh, uh, and that's the case if we have a, a horizontal band. A band means an exchange rate can vary vis-a-vis -vis another exchange rate, and it's horizontal, right? The price of this exchange rate doesn't gradually decline. It's, it's, it floats around uh, a horizontal line, and it doesn't float more by plus minus 2%. That's the that's a fixed exchange rate by this classification. <coughs> then what you can have is a crawling band. We have a band around which uh, in within which the exchange rate fluctuates, but <coughs> this is crawling. It's going gradually down or it's going gradually up, right? So that's uh, a limited flexibility exchange rate where we have a crawling band. The managed floating is one where we have exactly the same situation. We have a band that's crawling, so it's going up and down, and it, but it floats ar around this trend by plus minus five percent, and all the other ones are freely floating exchange rates. There's a fifth category which is freely falling. In the d in the countries that we're going to look at, we don't have that, but this is these are currency crises. So in Argentina, for instance, when the when the Argentinian peso collapsed, so we're not going to look at them. Today, we're going to talk about them when we talk about financial crisis. And this is how it looks like. This is the de facto and the, the, uh, and the, the euro exchange rate regime. So the solid line is what <coughs> countries uh, say. The, def the dashed line is what countries really do. And then a one on this y-axis is a fixed exchange rate and a four is a flexible exchange rate. So one is here, that's a fixed exchange rate, and four is here, that's a flexible exchange rate. And that's for the different <coughs> countries from 1975 to 2005. So we see a pattern here. So the first is that, so the United States says it's, has a, it's having a flexible exchange rate. It intervened much more heavily at the beginning uh, of the post Bretton Woods area but then it's actually uh, really letting the exchange rate float. So exchange the uh, United States does what it says and it's fully flexible. <coughs> the same for Australia, the same for Japan, and uh, exactly. So those are the big countries which tend to have a more flexible exchange rate. Then we have the smaller countries, look at Ireland for instance, they fix the exchange rate and actually also follow and and uh, do what they say. Then Luxembourg has says it has uh, limited flexibility, but de facto it's fully fixed. Same for Netherlands. Uh, the same for Denmark. Uh, Germany is an interesting case because they say they have it, they f they fix it, but de facto they let it float. Normally it's the other way around. Normally we have countries saying that they let it float, but they de facto fix it. Uh, and that's Switzerland, for instance. Look at Switzerland. Switzerland says we're having a fully flexible exchange rate. That's what they say. But de facto, they are f interfering really heavily in the foreign exchange market, right? So Switzerland is a country that's not honest about what they do. And then we have um, 
countries like Italy that go back and forth. But we see a trend here. So Britain says it has an, it's having a, a flexible exchange rate. It's fixed for very quickly. And now it's actually fairly flexible again. So the point here is that we see massive variation in exchange rate regimes. And, we, and this variation has an important implications, distributional effects. Some groups within a country win from fixing and some lose. And some groups, uh, so some groups lose from having a fixed exchange rate. So that's what we're going to explain now. Who wants a flexible exchange rate and who wants a fixed exchange rate and who gets what? That's the point here. So those are the questions here. Who benefits from monetary stability and monetary flexibility? So we have, we, have two, we have two dimensions when we talk about exchange rate, and that's different from trade. In trade, we can, have, we can have protectionism or free trade. Here we can have a stable exchange rate or flexible exchange rate and a high value of the exchange rate or a low value of the exchange rate, right? So those are two different things that you need to look at. So this week, we're going to, if you look our, at our analytical framework again, we're going to look at this part again. We're going to look at the interests of the key actors, key groups within the country, and how this then affects policy. Last week, we looked at this part, right? So this is the starting point, and you might have heard about this. This is uh, all based on the Mandel Fleming model, which is a model that explains or tries to analyze or is analyzing how, uh, how the short-run relationship between the nominal exchange rates and interest rates and growth is. And from that, we can derive what governments actually can do and what they cannot do. So, it's called the Trinity because the government and society in general wants to have, wants to, want has three goals. The first one is stability, a fixed exchange rate. Why do we want a fixed exchange rate? What's good about fixed exchange rates? Yeah. So uh, it encourages international uh, economic transactions like investments because we have more security and less risk. But we also want policy autonomy. So that's the Keynesian story, that's the Keynesian part here, right? We want policy autonomy because we want to be able to influence, uh, we want to reduce unemployment if unemployment is rising. That's the idea here. And we want to use monetary and fiscal policy for that. We also want capital mobility. Why? Because we want to be able to draw on international capital if, uh, which might actually help us to generate growth if, if we are a capital scarce country. So we want access to international capital markets. The problem is we can only choose two out of these three goals. So why? So assu assume we have all three. Or we have a fixed exchange rate and we have capital mobility. So that's a gold standard situation, right? So this can be di applied directly to the gold standard. And now we also have, we, we, we want to have po uh, policy autonomy, which means we are having a recession and that's why we expand money supply. So we have uh, an expansionary monetary policy. The interest rate falls below the interest rate of the in, the in the rest of the world. What's happening? Yeah. Capital will leave the country because returns are higher somewhere else. So with capital mobility, there's a capital outflow. What's the problem? <coughs> so under the fixed exchange rate, there should be no depreciation but there is pressure on the exchange rate and eventually it might collapse, right? That's the point. We might run into a currency crisis. So if we want to have policy autonomy and a fixed exchange rate, we need to restrict capital, capital mobility. That was Keynes' proposition. That was the Bretton Woods system, right? Or 
if we want to have a fixed exchange rate and we want to have capital mobility, we cannot have policy autonomy. That was the gold standard. We gave up policy autonomy, which led to undemocratic politics, and uh, or which was based on uh, uh, undemocratic politics. Or uh, we want to have policy autonomy and capital mobility, but then we, have to we need to have a flexible exchange rate. That's the point. That's the trade-off that we are facing. So we have this dilemma, and different groups want a different combination of choices, right? Some groups want o policy autonomy and capital mobility, some want uh, uh, co capital mobility and a fixed exchange rate, and so on. So this itself doesn't tell us what a country uh, will do. It just tells us the trade-off that every country faces. <coughs> now, to understand what a country does, we need to add political factors. And that's what we're going to do. So we're going to rely first on the class model, and actually that's exactly what we talked about when we, talked, uh, when we discussed the breakdown of the gold standard. We're going to apply exactly the same logic. So we have different groups. We have workers and capital owners. And workers get their income from employment, and, uh, and, and capital owners have their income from returns on capital. We can add a middle class which, has, which, has, which gets income from both unemployment and from returns, right? So the different groups put different weight on uh, employment and price ability in, in, uh, depending on their income sources. And we're assuming an inverse relationship between unemployment and, and inflation. That's this Phillips curve which I'm going to criticize in a moment. So I showed you this picture last week about uh, unemployment here, varying from 3 to 6.5% six, uh, 6 on the x-axis, and inflation uh, varying from 0 to 6% on the y-axis. And this is the relationship between these two variables in the United States in the 1960s. From 1960, where we had high unemployment and low inflation, we went to low unemployment and high inflation. Right. That's just a reminder from last week. I'm going to show you how this develops actually when we in the six in the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s in a moment. That's the idea. And uh, this was uh, then being picked up by a um, political scientist called Douglas Hibbs uh, in already 1977. And this is actually a paper. This was published in the American Political Science Review which is the most important political science uh, journal, and this is one of the most influential papers in that journal that was ever published. Today we know about these stories, but back then it was actually fairly new. So, we assume we're having three parties who represent different groups, different classes. The first one, the socialist class, is representing the working class. The socialist party is representing the working class. And they care about different things. They care about employment, growth, price stability, and uh, the balance of payment equilibrium, to what extent we have a current account deficit or surplus. But in this order, they mostly care about employment, and they put fairly little weight on price stability. Then we have a center party, which represents the middle class, which cares about both price stability <coughs> and growth and employment. And then we have the conservative party, which uh, represents capital owners, and they care mostly about price stability. They put very little weight on employment, right? And then what Hibbs did is he just looked at how long these different parties have been in power in European, con in European countries from 1945 to 1969. So this is a percentage of years of the socialist parties in the executive. So zero years in Canada and the US, 100, per uh, 100 per all the years in Sweden. And then on the y-axis, we have average percent rate of price inflation. Right? So how high is inflation under different political parties in government in this period? And we clearly see a very strong positive relationship. So in Sweden, we have left-wing parties in government and the Scandinavian countries in general. 
and we have high inflation above, on average around 5%, right? Then in Canada, the United States and West Germany, where we have very few, where we don't have these parties in power, we see very low inflation between 2 and 3%, right? And when we look at unemployment, we look, uh, we see, so this is now unemployment with again the same variable on the, on the x-axis. We see a negative relationship, meaning that in those countries with no labor power in government, we see high unemployment, 5%, back then this was high. And we see low unemployment in countries where we have uh, uh, labor parties and socialist parties uh, in government for a long period of time, right? So f with no Labour Party we in government we have 5% unemployment and with 100% Labour parties we have 1% unemployment on average in this period. So what does this mean for the exchange rate? What's the implication here for the exchange rate? So this is only about the, the domestic economy. But what if you take this result and combine it with the Mandel Fleming theorem and this trade off between these three goals, what would you expect? Who chooses what? It's pretty straightforward. Yes. Is that exact? So a floating exchange rate would mean flexibility, right? So a fixed exchange rate means stability. So stability means is equi uh, a fixed exchange rate means price stability, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So we mix it up exactly. So the Conservative Party wants price stability and therefore also wants exchange rate stability, while the Socialist Party wants flexibility and cares about employment. It wants to have the ability to influence, to reduce domestic unemployment, and therefore it wants a flexible exchange rate. That's the class story. That's the factor model in, s in some ways of exchange rate politics. Now, <coughs> we, can we can also develop a sectoral model which uh, is a bit more tricky. So this one was just uh, uh, straightforward, but this uh, the interest group model is more tricky. So just like in trade politics, we're going to divide the economy into uh, dif different sectors. We have exporters. We have sectors that compete against imports from abroad. We have a sector. Now we add a sector which is the no which produces non-tradable goods. Who would be that? Who are the non-tradable sectors or the most important ones? So the public sector is the most important non-tradable sector, right? Uh, that's not something you would sell. Th th they don't produce something that you would sell in another country. And international investors, and actually the role here, so those are the big banks, but the role here is unclear. In the paper by Frieden, he comes up with a different conclusion than the Oatly book. So we're going to ignore them for the moment. So you have two options. You can choose a fixed exchange rate and a flexible exchange rate. And you can try to have a, a, a low exchange rate, which means uh, your currency is worth little relative to other currencies, or a high exchange rate. right? So let's put those into, into this, those groups into these boxes. So y here you have, on the, you have exchange rate with stability. So high stability would mean a fixed exchange rate and low stability would be a flexible exchange rate. Can a high level and a low level. What would the exporter want and why? So now as an exporter, what do you want? Well, you want to export a lot, of course. So what helps you? Yeah. You want a low currency because then your goods are cheap abroad. Exactly. So here we want a low currency. 
And what in terms of stability would you prefer? High stability because that reduces risk. What about the importers or the import, co not the importers, the impo those who compete against imports? What do, we th what do they want and why? Yes. Exactly, but now it's actually tricky. They want a low currency as well because that means that the foreign goods are expensive at home, right? That's the trick here. That's, that's, a, that's a complicated thing here. So if the exchange rate is low, that means that everything that's being produced abroad is more expensive, right? If your exchange rate increases, you can buy more of, of, this, uh, of the same goods for the same amount that you earn, right? That's a complicated thing here. So import competitors also want a low exchange rates because that makes foreign goods expensive at home. But they want, a low, they want low stability because if there's a lot of variation, that inhibits trade. You want to prevent trade, right? You don't want trade. What does the non-tradable producers want? The public sector. That's going to be important in a moment when we talk about Switzerland, right? So think about it. So those who are non-tradable producers, their income does not depend on the exchange rate, right? They don't care when it comes, they don't face competition. But if, they are exchange, if the exchange rate is high, if the Swiss franc is becoming more and more valuable, they can consume more, they can buy more in Germany and in France, right? So they want a high exchange rate, okay? And that's what you get. So, and that's the difference to the trade part. The exporters and the import competitors, they have the same preference now when it comes to ex exchange rate level. Before they were split in trade policy, but here they are united. That's a key difference. They are just united in, in, uh, on whether it should be a fixed or a flexible exchange rate. The key, the, the, key, the key political divide comes from the non-tradables producers against the tradables producers, right? The non-tradables producers want a high exchange rate. We're not going to talk about investors. This is how Frieden classifies the international banks. I put a question mark because it's actually not so clear. And in Oakley it's very different. He put them... He puts them somewhere different, so we should ignore them. Okay, I'll give you an example. So that's a theory. I'll give you an example for the sectoral model, and then I'm going to give you an the same example, how it applies to the, uh, to the class model. So the European monetary system, that's the EMS, that's a fixed exchange rate system that the European countries established in 1979 after the breakdown of, of the Bretton Woods system. It was the system that eventually led to the Eurozone. And uh, so this was the time when France was dissatisfied with, uh, with the flexible exchange rate. And there was Helmut Schmidt was the German chancellor and Valérie Giscard d'Estaing was the French president. And they agreed that they would now, they should have more stable exchange rates. And that was actually s uh, also, there was a political purpose to push European integration forward. And uh, that's the, those are the key politi uh, politicians who uh, promoted this, uh, this idea, but they were backed by big business. So there's the round table of European industrialists who uh, formed in 1983 to back up uh, politically this, uh, this European fixed exchange rate system, the EMS. And uh, part of this uh, group were the big firms like Siemens, Volvo, uh, Olivetti, Bosch, and so the big firms who had a big trading interest. So those were the exporters, right? And you can, you can look, we're gonna look at this next week, we're gonna see really hard packs to the German mark in those countries that had big exporting interests to Germany. So that's uh, Denmark, uh, 
that's uh, Belgium, and that's the Netherlands. They were those who kept that system most stable, right? They didn't devalue at all. Then we had the intermediate countries like uh, France, for instance, or Ireland. They were committed to this fixed exchange, but not too much, because they did not export so much to Germany. And then there were the others uh, uh, who export very little to Germany, or l much less, and uh, especially the southern European countries, and they were the ones that were most that had that run into trouble most often in the system. So that's a sectoral story. We have exporters who push for this, uh, for monetary integration. There's a class story in this model as well, in this in this period as well. So. Again, we have the European Monetary System, which was established in 1979, when a conservative, when we had a conservative French president. And then we see a shift in partisanship. So in 1981, it was in May 1981, François Mitterrand won unexpectedly won the election uh, of against uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, and he was running on a very expansionary economic platform. So when he came into office, what we saw is, we saw regular devaluations. Fro immediately in 1981, we saw a big devaluation of the French currency. We saw uh, a big devaluation in 1982, a big devaluation in 1983. And that was because, um, because Mitterrand was backed by the working class who wanted to have more flexibility in monetary and fiscal policy who wanted to pursue a more expansionary uh, uh, economic policy, which was not consistent with the fixed exchange rate because we also had capital mobility. That's the problem here. So we saw a shift away uh, as, uh, we sh saw a shift from a conservative to a, a, a socialist party, and we saw exactly what Hibbs predict would have predicted, that this new party wants more, fl uh, more flexibility. Um, so France didn't drop out, so what happened in 1983 was the German uh, Social Democratic Chancellor was replaced by Helmut Kohl, who was a conservative, right? So before it actually worked, uh, the two matched well. We had a French conservative and a German Social Democrat, and they had roughly the same policy preferences, right? But now we move in opposite directions. France is now governed by a, uh, by a socialist, and Germany is now governed by a conservative. And the German government made pretty clear, we're not going to change our policy. We're gonna not going to, uh, Mitterrand said, you should have more, you should also have a more expansionary economic policy. And Kohl said, no, we don't do that. So France had the option between staying in, uh, in the system and changing its policy or dropping out. Dropping out was politically also costly because it basically would have meant that they failed to push European integration forward. So what the, fr uh, what the Mitterrand government did in end of 1982 and uh, beginning of 1983, they announced a change in policy, was called the politique de rigueur, uh, to keep the system stable. So we're going to talk more about this next week, about the motivations uh, and the explanations for this behavior here. But the point is, the European monetary system became more and more stable. There were mo less and less uh, devaluations. That led uh, then to the idea that we should have a, fi uh, a currency union, the Eurozone, which was then negotiated uh, from 1989 onwards towards 1999, and that led to the Maastricht Treaty, which then established the Eurozone. So that's the short story of what's going to happen uh, after this. So let's quickly, I'm gonna, I just want to very quickly show you <coughs> a more broader test of these, of these uh, arguments. So the argument here that's made by David Beers uh, is that left parties, it's exactly the same. Left parties represent import competing producers. Right parties pr uh, represent the multinationals and that's why the right parties want more stability and the left parties want le more flexibility and he tests this he looks at interest rate differentials, which is a measure of policy autonomy, and exchange rate uh, <coughs> uh, variability, which is a measure of 
flexibility in OSV countries from 1975 to 1980, uh, 1992. I'm just gonna, this is a small table, so I'm gonna make it bigger. So here, what you see here is that the dependent variable is monetary autonomy. That's the interest rate differential that a country has to the world interest rate. And he looks at a number of variables, and here it's whether we have a left government. And the coefficient is consistently uh, positive, which means that if there's a left government in power, we see a greater interest rate differential between that country and the world economy, which means that this confirms that left governments systematically want to have more flexibility, right? So the positive coefficient says if, there's, if the government is more left, there's more, the interest rate differential is greater. So the theory actually works fairly well. So before we go into the break, I want to actually apply, make this more concrete and apply this to Switzerland. And uh, so the we cannot test the class argument in Switzerland because there's no change between left and right in the government, right? <coughs> All the major parties are in government, so we don't see a variation in this independent variable over time. So we don't, we cannot, we cannot test it, right? But we can look at at, at it nonetheless. So this is what happens. So this is the Swiss, this the exchange rate between the Swiss franc and the euro from 2008 to 2017. So this is uh, this is the amount of euros that you get for one Swiss franc. This is the amount of euros that you get for one Swiss franc, and this constantly increases when the eurozone crisis started. So from 2009 onwards, we see, and this was one of the at the uh, when the eurozone crisis really. Uh, the situation really deteriorated, so then the Swiss franc became more and more expensive, right? And in uh, September 2011, the Swiss National Bank announced that they would fix the exchange rate at an exchange rate much lower, so uh, they decreased the value of the Swiss exchange rate uh, to make exports more attractive abroad. It was basically an attempt to, it was a measure to help the exporting industry. And then this went on for a while, and in January 2015, they suddenly gave up this fixed exchange rate. And the Swiss franc, of course, sh uh, there was uh, it, it, the value increased massively, it ranged really high. So here this appeared, they, they, the Swiss National Bank interfered pretty heavily. Uh, to to depress the value a bit, and now here, this is a turnaround that was just uh, in the last few months. What when uh, Mario Draghi, the ECB president or the chairman of the ECB board, announced that they would gradually increase interest rates, then immediately the Swiss, the value of the Swiss franc was falling. Right. So that's a story. Now. This caused a lot of pub, uh, political outrage. So do you remember what the positions of the different interest groups and political parties were? Who wanted what? So which party supported this decision to give up the fixed exchange rate? Yeah, so EDC who supported this, uh, who else? So the Liberals supported it, more or less, and the Social Democrats, the Socialist Party was opposed. So we see that, um, so the we see a clear partisan uh, split. And here, if you look at the, here there's a, uh, there's a link 
to the website of the labor union if it opens which is saying that the Swiss National Bank should assume its responsibilities to help the exporting sectors and the working class, right? So in that way, we need to adapt the model a bit. So it, it, uh, we need to adapt the model a bit. What we have here, a reverse situation where we want fix a fixed exchange rate, we want stability with the goal to have, to, uh, have a low value, right? Uh, which is in, in the interest of the, of the exporting uh, f firms. So let's vote. I'm just interested. What do you think about this? So who, would, who says, yes, it was right that the, e uh, that the Swiss National Bank gave up this fixed exchange rate, which led to an increase of in the value of the Swiss franc? Who thinks this was the right decision? Who thinks this was the wrong decision? Come on, you must have an opinion. This is so important. <laughs> Let's vote again. You have to take a choice, if, if you're not entirely sure. Do you think it was the right decision? Do you think it was the wrong decision? It's almost 50-50. Why, so those who say yes, it was the right decision, why? Why do you think so? Why do you think so? Yes. So the accumulation of foreign exchange <laughs> reserves and we that uh, poses risk. Uh, if if the if if that currency dissolves, for instance, then the future value of these currency holdings is unclear. That would be one problem. Uh, what else? Yeah. Why was my question this wrong? But that the euro was too weak. Which means. Which means that if they start holding <coughs> them, uh, it wouldn't have <coughs> been a substitute in for the money. So you think the argument is that the Swiss National Bank actually is unable to do that for a really long time because it's not a Swiss problem, it's a European problem. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Why do you think it was wrong to do it? Those who, s who thought it was wrong, why? Yes. So it's all about the exporters, right? And also about the import. So here you can see how the exporters have a clear interest uh, for a low exchange rate. Who would be the imp those who compete against imports in Switzerland? Make, let's make this a bit more specific. Who is competing against imports? It's a bit more complex, yes. So agriculture uh, is competing against it, but they are protected already with tariffs and other means. So they don't bother about this too much because it's true, it's agriculture, but they are protected in different ways. So they don't face that problem so much. Who else? So tourism is uh, competing. It's not about, uh, tourism is not uh, competing against goods that are brought here, but they are still competing against uh, Swiss, uh, against French ski resorts or Austrian ski resorts. So exactly, tourism is the main import competitor, yes? So where would the public sector, f uh, where's the public sector? The public sector plays an important role, and I'm gonna come to this in a moment, but it's a non-tradable sector. They don't face competition. So what should employees of the public sector want? So they should, on average, be in favor of this move because they can now buy much more, right? So to the extent that you would go to the public sector, you should favor this. Actually, it worked very well last year. I, made the sa I had the same vote last year, and the, there was a massive majority for a high Swiss franc with the argument that they could consume more and 
being potentially employed by the public sector, that's exactly what the model would predict. All right? So this model that I just showed you, the sectoral model, actually has a lot of explanatory power. You can have many other uh, views on exchange rates, of course, for different reasons, but they can be highly politicized, and the model does explain pretty well the political cleavages within a society over exchange rates. Any questions about this? Good, so let's take a break. Let's take, a yeah, we can take a 15-minute break. Come back at 20 past 11, please.
Okay, let's move on. So there was there was a confusion which I want to clarify here about the Swiss case. And the confusion is that uh, so a few few of you asked me in the break. We said that the Conservative Party wants more stability and the left party wants more flexibility, but here we see that the conservative parties actually favor the flexible exchange rate and giving up the peg. Now that's because the Swiss case is a bit peculiar because here s stability and the level are not independent. You can only have a low level in this situation when Switzerland is operating as a safe haven in a crisis situation by fixing, right? If you have, uh, if you have high stability, only you can only achieve a low level of the exchange rate by having a high, high stability, right? So the two are not independent. So the left party still uh, wants to help workers, but the way they, need they can help workers in Switzerland in this situation is by fixing, because only in this way they can have a low exchange rate, right? So the two are not independent. And the level concerns are trumping and dominating the stability concerns. That's the thing. So you need to adapt the model a bit to apply to Switzerland simply because Switzerland is a pecu uh, peculiar case uh, in when it comes to exchange rates and monetary affairs. But the logic behind the models that the left party wants to help the workers and the right party wants to help capital owners still applies. Okay, so that's all about interest groups. We uh, talked about the government and especially when we talked about the political motivations of Nixon's and how they led to the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. <coughs> I want to put that story again on a more general, uh, uh, on a more general basis. So and here we can rely on economic voting literature. You, you might have heard of this, that we have two actors, we have governments and voters, and the goal of the government is to uh, be re-elected, and voters care about their real income, growth and uh, employment, and if the government manages to produce a good out the outcome that they like, more income, more employment, then they reward the government and re-elect the government. There's a bit of problem here with this logic in the sense that they are just looking backwards and not forward. Um, also when it comes to, so, and this relationship is really strong. So I'm going to give you the results for the United States here. Um, it also applies to other countries, to some extent a bit less, because in the US it's really clear who's responsible for the economy. And it's also strong in Britain because we have one party who's in government, it's really clear who's responsible for the outcomes. In a country like Switzerland, it's not clear, right? We have many parties in government. So in, th in these countries uh, with many parties in government, this relationship is less clear. But in the US, it is. So here, you see that's the real income growth over the presidential term. So to what extent the income of voters was increasing, either not at all or up to 4.5% in the past four years before the election. And this is the vote share, the votes that, a, that the party, the candidate of the party that is in power receives. So that way, this 50%, this below 50%, so here you're going to lose the election, this 60%. And we, saw us, we see a very strong relationship. The more a country experiences income growth, the more likely it is that the government is re-elected. So I'll give you some examples. We talked about Nixon, right? Uh, this was, that was 1972. So he was the incumbent. As we see here, during his term, there was a high growth of income, and he received over 60% of the popular vote. Here we have, for instance, so here we have 2000. That's Al Gore, who was the incumbent because he was the vice president. Uh, under the Clinton era, uh, Cl Clinton presidency, and uh, this is against George Bush Jr. So actually, by this model, uh, Al Gore did poorly 
he should have received more votes than, but on pr in general it r it's, it's in this pattern, but he receives less votes that he should have received <coughs> uh, based on income growth during the, uh, the second Clinton presidency. Um, let's look at some others. This is 1992, so this is George Bush Sr. who got not re-elected and this model gives an explanation because income growth was poor during his second term. That's why he only received, why he received less than 50% of the votes and that's why he lost against Clinton. Here there are two outliers where the incumbent gets fewer votes than he should based on economic performance. That was, it can be explained by the two big wars, first the Korea War and the Vietnam War. So these, these presidents were punished for the big losses uh, and the many deaths that the US Army was incurring in this war. But in principle, we, saw this tr we see this strong relationship. <coughs> now the question is, uh, yeah. When did Obama, Obama in, uh, so his re-election, you mean? You mean Trump against Clinton. So Clinton would be the incumbent because she's from the incumbent, the pr candidate of the incumbent party. So I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you a website where you can look this up. But it was very close. I think it would have been. S I think Clinton was predicted to have, or tr uh, Clinton and Trump ha were predicted to have about exactly the same amount of votes. So they were both below 50% because it also uh, considered third party candidates. But uh, I'm going to look at this in a moment. So there's, b yeah. Uh, Gore is not an exception. He's, he's in this pattern, right? But by how much growth, income growth they generated, the prediction was that he would receive almost 50, f so th this, this regression line tells you how much he should have received based on just considering income growth. And so he, would, uh, he should have almost received 54%, but he received only 50% of the popular vote. And because of the American election system, the popular votes and whether you win doesn't really match. But he should have received more votes if we just look at income growth during the second Clinton term. And so this deviation can be explained by other factors like charisma, whatever, right? Okay, again, so the mechanism here is a bit unclear. Uh, if you just look backward, that's a bit bizarre, right? So it means that you judge candidates based on past behavior, but you're, looking, you're se uh, selecting a president for the future, right? So backward behavior is not really very, very sophisticated, but there is, a, there is an argument about, you can extract signals about government competence from these outcomes. So the point is that you're uncertain about the competence of a policymaker, how good this policymaker is, and you can learn, reduce uncertainty, you can learn about the competence of this policymaker by looking at past performance. That's going to be important when we look at elections and exchange rates in a moment. Uh, you asked about the uh, US election. So there's, if you click on, if you click on this link here, you're going to get to a website by one of the, by FAIR. FAIR is one of the first ones who developed these economic voting models. So this is a prediction for the next election in 2018, that's the election for Congress, not for president. He, predic he made predictions here. It's a more complicated model than I just showed you, but he, here he made predictions from November 2014 to October 2016. So that was the last prediction before the la last presidential election. And VP is the uh, presidential vote share. This is for Congress, the VC. This is for the presidency. <laughs> And this is the share that he predicted Clinton would get, 44%. Um, actually, Clinton got more than 50% of the popular vote. So this is about the popular vote. Now, the American party system, or the American electoral system, means that it goes states by states, right? So the, p the 
all the the whole the vote share of a, of a candidate in the whole country doesn't mean doesn't tell you yet who's being elected. That's one problem of this model. It gives you a tendency. Uh, Clinton actually got more than this, so the model didn't do too well in this election. But look at this site, and uh, it's going to give you. He makes a commentary here at least. He comments on his poor performance in the past election. Um, so this economic voting story applies to Nixon, right? That's the background to Nixon's behavior in 1972. Uh, but there is another story, which is the competence model. So if you, uh, if you devalue, maybe not in the US, the US is a special case because its currency is so dominant <coughs> and we don't need to bother about it too much as a country. But if you announce that I'm going to keep the exchange rate fixed and then you devalue, it actually sends a signal of incompetence because you're not able to keep up to your promise, right? And that's why in many countries devaluation is politically costly. And that's what these people looked at. They looked at elections and government changes in Latin America and they looked at 10 months before and 10 months after the election or the government change. So this is nine months before the government changed. This is the zero, is the month of the government change and this is nine months after the government change. And here we see the percentage change in the, the depreciation in the exchange rate. And what we see here is that the exchange rate always changes after the government change. Because that gives, um, gives them, because they want to avoid uh, they want to avoid, new governments have the possibility to, to change the exchange rate without being punished because they just entered into office. But if you look at elections, zero is now the month of the election. You never, you see very little change before the election. And then after the election, governments start to devalue. So they av avoid devaluations before elections because that makes them look incompetent. Okay, this is all the political story here. So let's look at the more uh, technocratic approach and this looks at um, this looks at the this we see a change in the postal consensus that emerged in the 1970s. Um, and here the belief of this Phillips curve and the unholy trinity is that you can fine-tune the economy by exploiting this trade-off between inflation and unemployment. That has been criticized uh, quite a lot. And it's actually a it's central for the debate uh, about economic policy today. So why is that a problem? If people look backwards, that might work. But if people look forward, and anticipate what the government's going to do, this, all is, this is all going to uh, uh, break down. So that's rational expectations. Under rational expectations, forward-looking uh, actors, money has, is neutral. It ha doesn't have a strong effect on the economy. <laughs> now lo let's look at this. So this is a time consistency problem. We talked about time consistency already a few weeks ago when we talked about fixed exchange rate systems. So that is a situation when your promise is not credible. And that governments face exactly this problem here. So this is a problem that was central in economic affairs and uh, uh, two authors that developed this in the 1970s, Kittel and Prescott, they won the Nobel Prize for it actually. So we have a government and a labor union. Government wants have high em um, uh, employment and high price stability and the union and workers care about real income. So how are the two related? So we are now developing a, a game, a strategic situation. How are the two related? Why does the union care about the government? Well, the real income is you, what you earn minus 
adjusted by inflation. If prices become more uh, are higher, you can buy less with your with your income. That's the problem here. So this is this that's the situation. So the government says, well, I'm going to keep the inflation low. I'm going to keep the inflation at two percent. Then, in the next step, the, the labor union sets a wage, or they bargain in a wage with the employer. And they say, well, we want to have a real income increase of 1%. So the government said, inflation is 2%, so we're going to demand, we're going to set the wage increase at 3%, right? And then we're going to be fine. Then the government has the possibility to change its behavior. It now chooses inflation. <coughs> now here, it has, a, uh, it has an incentive to cheat. So its incentive now is different from its announcement before. It's not consistent over time. That's why it's a time consistency problem. So the government has this incentive to cheat because if it chooses inflation, a higher inflation rate, <laughs> employment increases or unemployment goes down by the Phillips curve, right? Now the problem is the union is not stupid. The union anticipates this, right? So what would you do? You're the union. You know that the government wants to cheat you. What would you do? Excuse me? You ask for more. You want a higher wage. So now you, ask, uh, you dem demand a wage that's higher, which means you, it, this go, goes back and forth until we have an equilibrium where the, g uh, the union demands a high wage. The government chooses a high inflation rate and there is no effect on, uh, on, on employment, right? So we are in a, we are in a situation where we have a, a Pareto superior outcome. So we have high inflation and no effect on unemployment, right? Um, so the Phillips curve is relying on a bit on stupidity based on the side of the labor union. The labor union is not a able to look forward, but it's only looking backwards. But even then, there's a problem. So if you assume adaptive expectation, so the government says, I want to have, I'll have 2% inflation rate. The union says, oh, fine. So I'm going to demand not much. Then the government cheats the union. Now inflation rate is 5%. Now the union comes, now the union needs to at least adapt its, its behavior and think, okay, it's 5% now inflation rate, so I'm going to ask for 6% wage increase, right? Then the government chooses 8%. So this means that inflation needs to be pushed further and further and further up to make the Phillips curve work. So right, so this is time one. That's the natural rate of unemployment. That's the situation A. And then you push inflation up to bring unemployment down. So you're at this situation. Now the labor union adapts, right? So now we have a natural rate of unemployment which is this high, and to bring that down, we need to push inflation further up and uh, to, to bring in unemployment down to the same level we had before. And it's this goes on and on and on and on, right? So if you look at inflation and unemployment in this, uh, from, so this here, 1961 to 1969, this is what I just showed you, right? But then inflation rate increased massively up to here because all this was not credible anymore. And to bring inflation down, they now needed to uh, bring uh, unemployment up and we moved backwards again. Uh, in the 1980s, we were in this, <coughs> this, uh, this situation and in the, 19 in the 2000s, we were in this situation back then, right? It basically means you cannot play this game forever. The Phillips curve doesn't work forever. So under rational expectations, you still have this opportunity. You have what's called the new Keynesian Phillips curve. You can reduce unemployment by pushing up inflation, but only if this is unexpected. You can do this from time to time as a surprise, but you cannot do this systematically over decades. So there's a big debate. So this is, uh, I'll have here two links where the economist says, well, the Phillips curve, even the new Keynesian Phillips curve might be broken for good, right? 
and if there's a writer in the Financial Times says that this Phillips curve has not disappeared yet. So you click on this, you see that um, economists saying that Phillips curve uh, might be broken for good and central bankers nonetheless ins insist that this still works and it's underlined the models of central bankers, which is a problem if it's if this model is actually false, right? So there's this debate whether what cent central bankers do and the theories that central bankers use make sense and should be continued to be applied. So what's the solution? There's a number of solutions, and one of them is the so-called conservative central banker. And here the idea is to take monetar monetary policy away from the government who has a short time horizon because it faces elections. And we give it to a central banker, we delegate monetary policy to a, a central banker who has a long time horizon, who cares about the infinite future. And, uh, and this allows the banker to uh, build a reputation for low inflation. So we we can choose a banker with a preference for price stability. We can make, a, we can design the contract and the income of the central bank in a way that he earns more or she earns more if inflation is low and, and they earn less if inflation is high. And the result is, by this logic, is that we have low inflation and no negative impact on unemployment. So this is uh, the results. This is uh, central bank independence. There's there's measures of central bank, in, so they classify laws of central banks and determine how independent the central bank is from the government. And the most independent bank here is Germany. So bigger values mean more independence, lower values mean less independence. Switzerland is not in this graph, but it would also be up here. And here, this is growth. And what we see here is almost no relationship between central bank independence and growth, just as the model predicted. There is uh, almost no relationship between central bank independence and unemployment, but there's a negative relationship between central bank independence and inflation. So the higher central bank, the more independent the central bank, the less inflation, the less inflation we see. What is the problem here? Do you buy this story? Do you buy this relationship? Why is inflation in Germany low? What's an alternative explanation? Why do Germans hate inflation? Why are they obsessed with inflation? Yes. So there was hyper, and that's the standard story. There was hyperinflation in, in the interval period in Germany, and it had bad uh, repercussions on the economy, on the political system. That's why uh, Germans learned the lessons and now like low inflation and price stability. That's one story here. Now, what would that mean here? What would that mean for this result? Or more generally, there's Inflation attitude, so Italians care, don't worry, French citizens ver worry a bit less, are less obsessed about inflation. What does it mean? Well, this result is not, this relationship uh, is not because of central bank independence, but the central bank is designed in a way that it pro produces the results that the population wants. So it's all about inflation attitudes within the country and not about an independent effect of the central bank. That would be a critique, right? The central bank, just like low inflation, is just a result of something deeper, which is inflationary attitudes or potentially inflationary interests of, uh, of the majority in the country. So the central bank is one uh, solution. The fixed exchange rate would be another one. A fixed exchange rate allows for reputation building. If you want to build a reputation for stability, you need to, to show to you need to have a simple indicator that everybody can observe. 
So monetary policy is difficult to observe. We don't know what the Swiss National Bank is doing every day, right? But we can see whether the exchange rate is fixed or not. So suppose we have a government and an investor and, and the investor is uncertain about how much the government actually values price stability. <coughs> um, so the solution here is that the government chooses a fixed exchange rate to signal commitment to price stability because it's costly and easily observable. So in this uh, story here, if you, have a uh, if you have a credibility problem as a government, as a party, then you choose a fixed exchange rate because it allows you to signal to investors that you actually care about stability. Now here we're moving into an area where we get this uh, the a different prediction of what we had before. Who's facing credibility problems? If you were an investor and you look at, diff at the governments of countries, where would you invest your money and where would you not invest your money? Well, the left government has a greater credibility problem than the right government. Especially think about Latin America, right? Where you have more populist uh, governments. Then you would the left government has a greater credibility problem, so the benefit of a fixed exchange rate could potentially be greater for the left government. Also, an autocracy, for instance, cannot really delegate monetary policy to a fixed exchange rate because how can a, a government authority within an, an authoritarian regime cannot be independent? It's, it's an oxymoron, so you cannot, you cannot have that. So if the credibility problem is dominating, then this might actually trump political cons uh, considerations, which are the considerations we discussed in the first half of, uh, of today uh, with respect to the exchange rate. So here's an example. This credibility problem is particularly great in transition countries. So in Eastern European countries that Trans uh, transformed into a market economy in the early 1990s. So especially the former communist parties have a bad reputation among investors. And they wanna, they choose fixed exchange rate to improve their reputation about economic policy. So this is, I'm gonna make this bigger again. This is results on Poland from October 91 to October 1999. And here, Bodea uses a purely economic model to predict when a, an exchange rate would be devalued, a fixed exchange rate. And uh, the blue line is a political model to predict when an exchange rate will be devalued. So these are, these are the predictions of a devaluation in Poland by the model that accounts for government partisanship. And what we see here is that the model predicts a devaluation because, and here the model predicts a devaluation, the model predicts a devaluation here as well. And we see that they match actually with the actual devaluations in February 1998, in October 1998, in June 1999, and so on. And the key variable here is government partisanship. And these devaluations always took place under a conservative government. I think it was called the Democratic Union in Poland. And when a, a, a post-communist left-wing party was in power, it never devalued. It just didn't dare to devalue because it didn't want to, re uh, to damage its reputation. Because that would have immediately led to capital outflows and, uh, and bad economic outcomes. Okay, I'll skip this. So to conclude, 
what we find here is that we have a political approach which looks at the political cons considerations of governments and the credibility consideration of governments. And to some extent, they come up with contradictory predictions, right? In the first part, we said left governments want more flexibility, are more likely to devalue. Now we just learned that under certain circumstances, left governments are less likely to devalue and uh, want more stability. So depend which argument actually applies depends on really the specific situation of a government. If a government has a huge credibility problem, then it's more we are more likely in the credibility world. If the government doesn't have such a huge credibility problem, the political motivations that we discussed in the first part are more likely to apply, right? Uh, we also need to, what we haven't discussed, but what's a really important aspect is there's, it's a difference between whether we are in a flexible exchange rate world and we choose to fix, or whether we are in a fixed exchange rate world and we choose to give it up, right? The same mechanisms apply, but the logic is a bit different. Good, so um, this was a bit theoretical today, I guess, but next week we're going to talk about the uh, European monetary integration and the Eurozone crisis, and to understand this, the politics behind the Eurozone crisis, you really need to know what's going on here, right? So we're going to apply this, so partially we provided a more th a more solid theoretical basis for what we discussed last week and we laid the theoretical basis for what we're going to discuss next week when we talk about the Eurozone, okay? So see you then.